Uh, okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here, and I'm going to be going over the Wednesday day slate here, starting at uh, 1 Eastern for April 19th. Uh, we've got a 10-gamer on deck, and we have uh, one arm on the mound, and that would be Scherzer, and he's got a terrible matchup. Um, now, I'm recording this the night before. We're not going to have projections or ownership loaded into the sheet here. Um just yet, but we are going to go over the games and just kind of uh, get our bearings as to who we may want to uh, consider on the mound and may want to play uh, in a batter's box uh, against some of these pitchers. So since uh, since I'm doing this the night before, that thought I would take a, this opportunity to uh, remind everybody that um, despite the fact that we're going through all of this data and talking about numbers and, and whatnot, uh, we do still have the the most accurate um, aggregate projection that the industry is going to offer here. And that's because we're bringing in everybody from the rest of the industry and making our own kind of tweaks to, to things and and then spitting out the, uh, the ultimate aggregate here for a, a fantasy point projection and an ownership project, projection. Um, so despite the fact that we're going through all of this data, um, all of this data is already kind of baked into the projections and where we really want to kind of focus when we go through all of the numbers here is just kind of use all of this as, as tiebreakers, right? Um, when we've got guys in a similar price or price range, like a Charlie Morton and a Trevor Rogers or something like this. And we're considering between the two, that's kind of went, and they both got a, a similar projection within a quarter point or something. There's so much variance in baseball for pitchers and for hitters that a a two to three hundred dollar difference in price uh, may not really give us the the whole story and the projection and the value score and the ownership may not tell us the whole story. So it's kind of at that point where we've got to dig into the data and then inject our own sort of opinions and decide whether the projection that we're seeing makes more sense for a Charlie Morton in this particular matchup against the Padres or for Trevor Rogers in this particular matchup against the Giants. Uh, obviously, when we're building teams and we're constructing things, uh, that's when we get into the 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 DFS playing, right? Um, and that's when we get into the ownership. And we can use the the ownership aggregates from the broader industry as well to help us make decisions and once again use, um, use them as a, a tiebreaker, right? So that's really what we're all we're... All, all we're doing and all we're after here when we go through all of this data is just trying to sort of split hairs and get granular with things and be informed about the decisions we're making because realistically, I mean, we're putting money at stake here. So we want to um, we want to trust the projections, right? Because overall, we have to trust that the models and the computers are doing the math a little bit better than we can, right? Um, but we can also, when we're building teams, we can make our own decisions, and we have to make our own decisions. If we just run run builds and let the optimizers go crazy, uh, we're probably not going to to do pretty well long term, or do very well long term. Um, so we have to inject a little bit of our own analysis into some of these uh, DFS plays, and certainly in a sport as variant as baseball. Um, any On any given day, we can go and look at a hitter projection, and on any given day for Aaron Judge, the projection is probably going to be about 11 or 12 points, and it'll vary a point here or there depending on matchup and maybe some weather or something like that. Uh, but for the most part, it's going to be in the same range pretty much all season against pretty much every every guy he faces. Um, but unfortunately for us, it, if we were, once again, just to optimize everything, um, that would probably give us a, a lot of Aaron Judge every single day, which is 
you know, fine in in a vacuum, of course. But do we really want to be paying uh, the price tag for an Aaron Judge in a vacuum uh, when he gets an elite arm on on the other side, uh, as opposed to one that is very attackable? Now, obviously, that should be baked into the projection, right? You should see a naturally a higher number for a judge in the in the better matchup, of course. Um, but once again, there's so much variance in baseball that the the projection isn't going to double, right? And it's not going to tell you to just play 100% of a guy because there's still variance. And that's really when we get into the um, injecting the bias and gauging whether we think the median projection of some of these models is mostly accurate or for our risk appetite um, or is incorrect. The The projection is is the projection. It is what it is. And it's what the numbers are going to say. But where we really want to focus is attacking the, the ownership, right? And that is a lot more subjective and really where we are going to uh, differentiate ourselves and be able to make some money, certainly in, in a highly variant sport like baseball, uh, another like hockey, one that's far more projectable, like basketball, for example, you're basically just going to want to play the very, um, very highly projected plays pretty much no matter what, because you know if they're getting 35 minutes or something uh, at the point, I mean, it's just kind of unavoidable. You got to play them. Um, and in, in a lot of situations in baseball, for example, you can fade a very popular hitter, but in a lot of situations, you're almost lighting money on fire if you're fading uh, one of the best value and and projected plays in something like basketball because the volume is not the same, right? Um, LeBron is going to be on the court, if he's not hurt, far more often than the you know, sixth string guard or whatever uh, for the freaking Knicks or something, you know? Um, so that said, um, we can make some of these decisions in baseball and we can take these projections certainly with a grain of salt but we do want to also not kind of screw with them all that often um they are the most accurate that we're going to get and because we're bringing in every number that we can um so that's why we do this and and we want to get a good pulse on the entire industry and see where they are projecting all of these pitchers, uh, pitchers are far more projectable, right? See where they're projecting all of these hitters. Uh, and then we can use the ownership aggregates as well to make our our DFS decisions, right? And then we can go from there. And, and that's really all we're trying to do here. Analyze this data, go through the games, but use the projections and really not, like when we throw them into Saberson, for example, we don't want to be jacking with the numbers and just be like, eh, well, I'm going to ding this guy uh, 25% because I disagree or something. Now, if you think a projection is a little bit too high, it's not to say that you can't do that, right? Go ahead. But we want to be careful and we, want, we don't want to go too crazy with it. And same with the ownership. We don't want to adjust an ownership figure pretty much at all because that's what the numbers are saying. Right. What we want to do is build our teams to exploit that. Right. And that's where we can capitalize on some of the data here. And that's why we really try to dig into these pitchers and dig into the hitters and and try and and squeeze out some really granular data that is probably included in the projections. Um, but that may not be reflected in the ownership projection, for example, right? So, uh, spiel aside, that's why we're aggregating projections, and that's why we use them in conjunction with a bunch of data, certainly in a very high-variance sport. In other sports with um, 
with much more projectable outcomes like like basketball, right? You're better off just playing good numbers. Um, and, you know, it, it's more about pivoting and, and minutes projections in in basketball um, than just playing a highly projected hitter, right? So that said, spiel aside, let's, uh, let's get into the games here. And since we don't have projections, we're just going to go through some data and just kind of talk some numbers and and maybe get a feel for where we might land um, coming into the slate. So first thing, first things first, we're going to have San Francisco and Miami here. Alex Cobb, 7,700. We like the price tag here for Alex Cobb, and we like playing him because he's got a huge ground ball rate and he's got some strikeouts in the in the tank as well. Um, really, to both sides of the plate, little more susceptible to some contact and some average to the lefties at 271 with a 303 Woba. No power, though, whatsoever, because he's he's throwing the splitter to them and the curveball also and just burying it. So he's got a nearly 3-to-1 ground ball, right, two, 290, two lefties. So we're not really worried that he's not striking them out uh, at a 35 percent clip or anything like that when he's getting three to one ground balls he still has league average strikeout rate here at 22 percent so this is fine against lefties in the in the downside of the platoon for him uh against righties they'll hit for some average as well 263 298 woba is fine and it's really good to be quite honest and a 107 iso so also a very good number and sort of a uh uh, a saber slash there, if you will, uh, with the average WOBA and the ISO, but a 25% K rate to the right side as well. So we don't really want to be going after Alex Cobb in most scenarios because his ground ball rate's so high. Same with Logan Webb. We don't want to be going after these guys with huge, huge ground ball rates because it's pretty rare that they just get blown apart because they get so many ground balls, it allows them to get out of uh, really bad situations if they find themselves in them. Right, uh, and certainly we can attack the Marlins here in the early going. They're striking out at a 25% clip here. 82 WRC plus over 480 PAs, 145 ISO with a an average WOBA of 297, uh, but hitting a lot of ground balls here. 150 ag aggregate ground ball to fly ball ratio. Really not getting. A, a bunch of balls on the line either at sub 19%. A lot of medium contact, not a. a a terrible amount of soft contact, right? Uh, 12% is actually a pretty good number for a team um, that doesn't hit for a hell of a lot of power and strikes out a lot. But most of the contact is of the medium and medium plus variety rather than the hard variety, which we really want to target. Now, anything over 30% is a pretty good number. 30%, it, it's fine. Uh, but when they're hitting this many ground balls, it's kind of worrisome. So, Alex Cobb here, 7,700. I think this is a pretty good price tag. We've been playing him pretty much all season, and I don't really think that's going to change here. Um, the only guy over here for the Marlins that I think I would be interested in would be a Luis Rise, for example, at 4,400, but not super wild about that price tag. Uh, Trevor Rogers on the mound for the Fish, 8,500. I think this price tag is probably a bit elevated. Um, what we really don't want to be doing is targeting... Uh, targeting the Guardians pretty much ever. And in the early going here this season, uh, 191 PA, short sample against lefties. Um, uh, this, this is the Giants, actually. I was looking at the Guardians uh, as, as our next game, as a matter of fact. Um, but this the same kind of goes for the Giants here. Uh, they are striking out a lot um, against right-handers. And they're actually doing it quite a bit against lefties as well because a lot of their better hitters are hitting from the left side. So now that we're back on track here, um, short sample for them, 190 PAs, 56 WRC+. plus. This is terrible, right? 086 ISO, even though they do have a couple of sticky guys in a Tyro Estrada, J.D. Davis, who's been swinging a bat um, a little bit better. Wilmer Flores, still cheap, 3,600. Unfortunately, lost his multi-position eligibility. Um but still a, a piece or two that you can play. David Villar has got a, a good bit of pop. He's down in the bottom of the lineup. We're not crazy about a 4,100 price tag for him. But um, a couple of right-handers here that can make it a little bit difficult. They got to Jesus Luzardo the other day, as a matter of fact. Uh, and that's Miami's, well, Sandy Alcantara is their ace. But he's their solid number two. And kids got really, really good stuff. So they can get to some lefties over here can the Giants um, 
on a full slate here, we're probably lacking quite a bit in the um, in the power upside for these guys. Not to say they can't hit a ball over the wall. J.D. Davis got a lot of pop. Uh, Wilmer's got some pop. Tyro's got a little bit of pop. But you we want to be paying 5K for Tyro Estrada? Uh, I'm not sure. So not a favorite stack over here, but not really a an equitable target, I think, for the um, for Trevor Rogers either, because he gives up a little bit too much contact to the right side. 288 average, 377 WOBA, and a 2 211 ISO with some 30 with 32 percent hard contact rate to the right side. One and a half homers per nine. So um, not crazy about playing a Trevor Rogers. He has been you know, right around in the same price range, but. And it really all season, 8,100, 7,900, 8,300 in his first three starts. And he was actually really good in his last start against uh, Arizona. I believe he went six innings and got him for seven Ks off the top of my head, I think. Um, so he is playable in, in pretty decent matchups. I'm not sure that the Giants, given that they're trying to platoon a little bit more here, uh, are really the best matchup for him on on a full 10 11 game slate he's a fine tournament play i think he's going to come in probably some pretty low ownership and if i had to guess probably about a oh i don't know 16 point median projection uh give or take um so it's fine i think at at 8500 it's an okay tournament piece if you land on it but probably not going to be going out of my way to target him and with the Giants, I think the favorite play over here would probably be a Wilmer Flores. Price adjusted, but I think getting to a J.D. Davis at 4300 is a fine play as well. Okay, so let's now get on to the Cleveland Guardians and the Detroit Tigers. So we've got Cal Quantrill on the mound at uh, 8300 and I, it's really pretty rare that we've, we're playing Cal Quantrill. Um, he just doesn't have any swinging strike stuff and any upside whatsoever. And at an elevated price, I mean, it, he suppresses pretty well. But unfortunately for him, really all season, 86, 85, 8,700 on the mound, yeah, the price is down, but it's still elevated for a 16% K rate. And he's got a 3.5 ERA with a 450 XFIP. The numbers are fine, doesn't walk people, throws strike one, and stays off the barrel. But, oh wait, he's not going to throw it past anybody. So I'd rather get to a Trevor Rogers, a guy that does, while exhibits a, a little bit of a split um, deficit, so to speak, uh, against righties, he's got a little bit better K stuff, and 6% up to 22.5% or whatever it is, is 6%. Um, so I'd rather play him at $200 more expensive than Cal Quantra. I don't really want to play either of them, necessarily, but... Um, that's kind of how I'm I'm approaching this so far. At 8,300, I think he's just kind of overpriced. Really not interested. Even going after the Tigers, I would probably rather get to a Tiger or two, but I don't really want to do that. If I'm going to go after Cal Quantra, it's going to be with a righty because his K rate to righties is at 12.5%. That's a really, really low number. So they're going to hit for some average against him. 281, 317 Woba. Not so much in the way of power. Um, but a 281 average to a same-handed hitter, that's a big number, and that's really because he doesn't have much of a, in the way of breaking stuff, right? Throwing a, just kind of a show-me curveball at only 4% of the arsenal, but he's mostly a fastball changeup guy with a four-seamer cutter-sinker mix and a decent change. That keeps the lefties off balance, but really no breaking or, or wipeout pitch, even a a split change or anything that he can go after right-handers with. So that's why he's pitching to so much contact there. Full 83% contact rate. It's not bad contact necessarily, uh, and it's not on the barrel. So he's okay. He's He can suppress, and, and he can go six innings, strike out five or six here, um, and that's okay maybe in cash. But... Uh, in tournaments, we're, we're really just worried about upside. You can actually get to a righty or two, 3,400 now for Javi Baez. He's been awful, probably because he's not all that great a hitter, but there's we're starting to get into a range here where he has upside at the price tag, and I think that's a, a playable price on a full slate. Definitely not my favorite shortstop play, but now we're finally in the range where 
Um, I mean, 3,400 is pretty, pretty cheap, and he's still got a lot of pop. 12.5% strikeout rate, that's really Javi's problem, right? But a 12.5% strikeout rate from Cal Quantrill, uh, we're not really worried about that. You can play an Eric Haas if he's uh, behind the plate, and or a Jake Rogers even. Uh, Spencer Torkelson down to 2,300, also a lot of pop, also has strikeout problems. So if you want to get to kind of an off-the-board little two to three man uh, of the Tigers here. I think that's reasonable. Cal's not going to get played, so you're not getting a lot of leverage on the field. Um, and he's probably not going to project all that well, so you're unlikely to run into any of him in your builds where you'd have to, like, hedge or anything like that. Um, so really kind of off the board sort of tournament plays here. On the other side, you got Spencer Turnbull, who gets the Guardians, and they don't strike out at all. So uh, in the early going here, 486 PAs. Um, Against righties so far, 18% strikeout rate with a 12% walk rate. <laughs> like uh, the average walk rate in the league is about 9% right now. So this is uh, what is that? 25% higher than um, than the league average. I mean that's a pretty big number and uh, pretty discouraging when we when we want to try and attack. What's really overall a, a pretty weak lineup. Uh, they have some good hitters over here to the Guardians and uh, some professional hitters. They're taking professional at-bats, but no power, so we kind of want to go after them sometimes because they're not going to put up a lot of runs on us. 1.3 ground ball to fly ball, not a lot of hard contact. A, a kind of concerning 20% aggregate soft contact rate, not creating. You know, 10 ticks below league average at just a 90 WRC+. plus. Um, slightly better against lefties, but, like, are they really? So not really. Um, but we can't. We just can't go after them. They only have an 18% aggregate K rate. They're going to take professional at-bats. They're going to really make you work. And Spencer Turnbull here in the early going, even at 6000 it's an attractive price tag for him, but he's still really struggling to keep guys off the bases. He's pitching to an 82% contact rate himself, and... We don't really want to be dealing with that um, against the Guardians. You can stack some of them, but they're going to be frustrating, and it's going to be very difficult to get there in tournaments because they hit for such little power. Still 116 aggregate ISO here. That's a pretty low number. Uh, now, Turnbull is hes getting a little bit more comfortable. He was good in his last start, went five innings, struck out six against Toronto, and he was 5,800 in that start, and that's uh, really encouraging for Turnbull. Um Still a, about a neutral ground ball to fly ball in that start. Ground ball lean so far with, uh, what is this, 22 to 13 ground balls um, versus fly balls in his uh, three starts so far this year. So uh, encouraging that he's trying to keep the ball on the ground and at a 165 ground ball to fly, fly ball ratio so far, that's that's a good number. He's staying off the barrel. The problem is that the, the control just hasn't quite been there and he's pitching to a lot of contact still. So um, not something we want to be messing with with Cleveland. Uh, give me the, the usuals over here. Give me a Andres Jimenez, 4,600. I think that is a fine playable price. You can always play Josie, of course. Um, so give me some of the Guardians, but uh, not a lot of them. They're super frustrating to play. Okay, Arizona and St. Louis. Um, I think that we're going to see some offense here. Probably going to see some ownership as well. It's definitely not going to be on Mad Madison Bumgarner. Um, I think he has pretty much reached the end of the line here. The D-backs, unfortunately, they need somebody that can just eat innings for them. Um, and Bum, well, <laughs> he really hasn't showed that he can eat innings, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so far here, here in the early going, he's getting just absolutely blistered. Um, pretty much every start, and it's kind of been this way really going back to all of last season. Gave up five earned runs in his last start um, in five innings. Gave up just two earned in four and two-thirds against the Dodgers in his second start, but f in his first start against the Dodgers, gave up five earned as well. So uh, really not a lot of value and definitely not any value at 7,600. We're going to want to target him with the Cardinals. And finally, Wilson Contreras has gotten there. We talked about this yesterday. Um, at 4,400, I believe his, his price was. This is his price today at 4,300. Um, he ended up getting into two baseballs. So uh, finally taking better at bats and... Once they get him going in the in the middle of the lineup, 
with these guys getting on base, Goldschmidt, Arenado ahead of him, Alec Burleson, uh, even some Brendan Donovan or Dylan Carlson, Tommy Edmond, whoever they have leading off, they they let off Lars, I believe. Um, this was a the lineup before Brendan Donovan got scratched. Um, with Wilson Contreras in the middle of the lineup, not just grounding into double plays and striking out all the time, he's going to make this lineup really tick. And if they can get him going, then that this lineup is going to be very, very dangerous uh, with Goldschmidt and Arenado there. So uh, Arenado should be back in the lineup, just a scheduled day off for him, I believe. Um, and you still got to pay for him, but uh, I don't really care. Goldschmidt got into a ball against Dre Jameson, um, and he only got a $100 price bump here against Bum. He should have gotten a, a $1,000 price bump. This is a pretty damn good spot, and we're going to want to get to pretty much all of the Cardinals. You're going to see some ownership on these guys. Um, these were, were late projections, so, uh, ignore these numbers, but, um, you know, you're going to want to get to pretty much everybody here. Tyler O'Neill down here at 4,300 is a good playable price tag. Uh, I like Wilson Contreras, even though he hit two dingers, um, last night against, uh, against the D-backs. That's, that's kind of frustrating, but, uh, you can get to some of these righties. They may even lead off a Tommy Edmond hits really, really well from the right side. They like him from the right side. Could see a Dylan Carlson up in the two instead of an Alec Burleson. So we'll have to see what they do with the list. We should have it. It's um, one of the earlier starts, so nothing to worry about there. But we can attack Bum uh, pretty much at will here. Just a 16% aggregate strikeout rate, 225 ISO allowed, 1.6 homers per nine over his last 172 innings. Um, these numbers are markedly worse if you take the last, like, maybe 80 innings or something like that. 10% barrel rate, pretty high here for Bum. So very attackable for sure. Um, Jake Woodford on the mound, also very attackable. So we can get to some, a little more contrarian uh, Arizona stacks. They've been very impressive so far this season. Uh, I'm not sure if they actually won this game or if the late homer from Wilson Contreras um came back to beat them, but nevertheless, they've been very impressive so far. Also a team that's going to get on base and um, and run on you. So we don't really want to be running on Contreras behind the plate necessarily, but uh, that gives them a little bit more upside that they lack in raw power, right? Just a 166 ISO here, actually higher than the Cardinals in the early going uh, against lefties. 166 for the D-backs, uh, against righty split adjusted. It's a fine number, 307 Woba, 5.5% walk rate, super, super low. One of the lowest rates in the league so far. But again, just a 20% strikeout rate. So taking good at bats, making guys work, and kind of being pretty pesky at the top of the lineup here. Uh, certainly with Cattell Marte and Josh Rojas um, against righties. Christian Walker, he's going to strike out a lot, but... Um, you know, Lourdes, not so much. He's been fine in the three-hole here so far. Corbin Carroll at 4,100. Price has finally come up on him. They're probably going to stick him uh, in the five against uh, against righties here. So Jake McCarthy has been very cold. He was very good at the end of last season, so maybe he's a cheaper value piece that you can get to. But Cattell Marte is probably my favorite price-adjusted hitter here at 4,300. But you can get to pretty much everybody. Uh, I even like Josh Rojas, who doesn't, typically have a whole lot of you know raw power upside and you got to play him at third base price tag is elevated at 4700 but uh, Jake Woodford's not gonna blow up by him he has a 14 percent K rate himself just a bullpen arm still kind of holding down the fort until Wainwright gets back um, but probably not gonna be able to hold it down for all too much longer uh, Woodford has not been good to say the least in his uh, first several or first three starts of the season gave up six in his um, in his first start against Atlanta gave up another three against Milwaukee that was serviceable I mean he survived four and two thirds and survived again five and a third against Pittsburgh in his last start getting some ground balls uh, about 24 to nine ratio so two two and a half to one or so uh, in the early going uh, of course, this these numbers here incorporate last season's numbers as well. So he'll get some ground balls. So we'd like guys that can lift the baseball, get it in the air. Cattell Marte for sure. Uh, Corbin Carroll definitely. Um, 
I think we can get we can get to some a, a good bit of offense here in this game. Definitely the Cardinals, and I think we can play some uh, some lesser own Diamondbacks as well. Going after Jake Woodford, uh, we're definitely not playing in any pitching in this game. Uh, okay, Texas in Kansas City. I uh, hope you had some Texas um, because they were really the only team that scored uh, and did anything. Maybe the Maybe you had a, a one-off Wilson Contreras or something who had two dingers. Um, but Texas was the only team that did anything. And I think you could probably, I don't know, I, I kind of like getting to Brady Singer here. We'll get to him in a sec. Martin Perez on on the mound for the the Rangers at 7400 I like this price as well. And, and I think this is a good tournament play here. At uh, I generally don't like playing Martin Perez in in tournaments but he's probably going to see some ownership here um at 7400 i think the price is a little bit depressed and the royals are bad man this is a bad team and they're striking out at a full 32 percent clip against left-handers now we have a 130 pa sample right but so let's slow down but uh <laughs> this is a pretty alarming number here in the early going 56 wrc plus against lefties uh so far and even though Martin Perez only has a 21% K rate himself, really to both sides of the plate, uh, I think that's pretty uh, pretty attractive and an attackable, um, attackable statistic because K rate does con start to converge pretty quickly. So I think we can play some Martin Perez. He has suppression upside for sure, sub-3 ERA with a 380 XFIP, give or take. Strain rate maybe a little high at... Um, 78 percent but he gets a lot of ground balls pitching to this much contact maybe a little bit of regression coming for him to see the the era and the xfip xfip normalize a little bit and equilibrate but um you know for the most part i think this is a pretty respectable spot going after the royals we're probably going to be attacking them um all season they're gonna they're gonna heat up a little bit but uh martin perez is a good enough arm and and he throws a solid four-pitch mix here. But yeah, mainly a three, I guess, a show-me four-seamer anymore. But the sinker-cutter change is a really good combination for him. Show-me slider. Uh, good bit of value for him. And still getting a lot of ground balls, staying off the barrel, and really not walking people, throwing strikes. So at 7,400, I think it's a good tournament piece for you uh, if you want to get to maybe a more expensive Scherzer um, against the Dodgers or something like that. Martin Perez make it a little bit cheaper for you. 7,100 for Brady Singer on the other side. I think this is playable as well. He got blasted and gave up eight earned, I think, in his in, in the second inning uh, against Atlanta in his last start. Um, Texas probably not as potent as Atlanta, but Texas still has a couple of lefties that they could, that they could throw at Brady Singer that could get to him. Um, I'm not sure that... Some of these lefties are really all that great at hitters, however. They got Travis Jankowski. Um, he's kind of a career journeyman in the two-hole. Uh, they do have Leody Tavares, um, who they, unfortunately, would just stick in the nine-hole. They have Robbie Grossman. Now that they're missing Corey Seager, th from the left side of the plate, this team is uh, you know, leaving a, a little bit on the table. So, it really, it's... It's Marcus Semien, it's Adelis Garcia that are the, the two big power bats. Of course, they have uh, a Josh Smith, who's a very young hitter. He's been awful. And they have Jonah Heim behind the plate, uh, who will pop a little bit sometimes. Um, so they can get to him, Singer, with a couple of lefties here. They do have some guys, and guys that are, that are at least standing on the left side of the plate with a baseball bat. Um, and that's really his main susceptibility, 188. 88 ISO and a 1.6 homers per nine with a 43% hard contact rate to lefties. So you can get to a couple of these Texas pieces, but in, in full stacks, I'm not sure that we want to be targeting Brady Singer once again, um, just kind of a, as a bounce play. His price has come down to 7,100. He's been a little bit higher than that um, in most of his starts this season. I think all of his starts, as a matter of fact. And yeah, he was 8,900, 8,800, 7,600 against Atlanta, and then he got torched. So down to 71 here against really, I think it's um, kind of a, a mediocre lineup. They're starting to heat up for sure, and they put up a crooked number 
um, for sure. But 23% K rate, it's still attackable. And overall, I think I think Texas is um, you know, just kind of a, a mediocre lineup without Corey Seager in there, uh, even though they do have Adelise Garcia and Marcus Semien really turning it over. Of course, they have uh, Nate Lowe um, as well, who will really hit from uh, – hit both lefties and righties pretty damn well. So they've got some guys that can get to him. If you want to get to a Texas stack, I think it's all right. Um, not my favorite shorting a guy that just gave up eight in his last in his last start. Um, it's just not, very rare that it happens in back-to-back starts. So oftentimes, certainly at a depressed price tag, with a kid that I think has a little bit of upside, he's got a 24% K rate, um, Leaving a little bit on the table in the swing strike rate, but a lot of called strikes here because he stays down in the strike zone, and he's got kind of a goofy windup. Um, but get some ground balls with the sinker slider combination, lacking in the changeup, so that's why he's susceptible to lefties, but pretty okay against righties. Still has the K rate against lefties, so I think he can get through some of these pretty low upside hitters outside of Nate Lowe. Uh, from the from the left side uh, and attack them pretty well. Uh, we are still worried, of course, about Marcus Semien and Adelis Garcia hitting for some power and some average in this particular spot. But uh, at 7,100, I think this is starting to get priced in for Brady Singer, and I think he's a fine tournament piece that we can go after. Uh, you can play both sides, and uh, not that you could play the the Royals necessarily, um, but I think you play a, a couple of Texas stacks if you want. Because there's still some some vulnerability here for for Brady Singer, and just because it doesn't happen often that a guy gets blasted in back-to-back starts doesn't mean that it can't happen ever, right? So uh, certainly possible, uh, but I think I would mostly side with Brady Singer and Martin Perez on the mound. Uh, okay, Philly and Chicago White Sox. I think we can get through Taiwan Walker here pretty quickly. He's got a 20% K rate, and he's 9,900. I don't know where this came from. Um, this is every so often with, uh, with DK in the middle of the season, it seems like it happens early in the year. Um, you just get a totally wild price tag and that's really what we've got here with Taiwan Walker. It's, it's a bad matchup, so it's not that. Um, and really he hasn't been all that great this season. He, Gave up four and four and a third against the Yankees, two in in four and two thirds against the Reds, and one in another start against the Reds in six innings. Um, that was his really only serviceable start when he struck out four. Um, has hasn't really displayed any outsized K stuff yet this season, and they're just pumping the price tag. Um, eighty seven hundred, eighty two hundred, ninety one hundred in his first three starts. Now he's ninety nine. He gets White Sox. So uh, no thank you on the mound for Taiwan Walker. Um, do we want to play the White Sox, though? Well, no, not really. They, they kind of stink also. Pretty low upside, not going to create a whole hell of a lot, and frustrating that they're they're missing probably their best hitter in Tim Anderson. Uh, Yohan moncada has been down for a little while, you know, so um, they're dealing with the injury bug once again. They also lost Josie Abreu in the middle of the lineup, so they don't have even him to rely on, right? So they've got now, but from the left side, Gavin Sheets and and uh, who else do they have off the top of my head? Um, Oscar Colas down at the bottom of the lineup, right? Guys like this, um, but they're not Yoan Moncada. They've got Andrew Benintendi from the left side. Not a lot of ups- not a lot of upside there. So um, you know, not a a whole lot of pop for these guys. Yasmani Grandal behind the plate. Uh, really hasn't been hasn't been good since that one season in Milwaukee. Um, so we don't really want to be going after uh, pretty much anybody with the White Sox if they're uh, if they're right-handed. Um, even at 9,900, I mean, it, if you want to just like take some shorts on on Taiwan Walker here with the White Sox because he's 9,900 and he's he's just flat overpriced. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I mean, that that's a fine play. Um, but once again, the, the White Sox over here are pretty similar to the Guardians in that they're uh, pretty frustrating to stack Excuse me, because they don't hit for a whole lot of power. They're not going to hit the ball over the wall all that often um, outside of like a Jake Berger kind of guy. So 
Uh, certainly a, a Luis Robert has plenty of pop, but um, a big ballpark here, guaranteed rate in Chicago, and um, really not my favorite stack to go after a mostly respectable arm, but he's definitely overpriced. We're not playing him. Uh, Tywin Walker, that is. And we're not playing Cle Matt. Matt. Um, Mike Clevenger uh, on the other side. At 7,900, I think he's overpriced as well. 19% K rate for Clev. Um, and really for Sunshine, I mean, he had he had a good start. He's had two good starts. A couple of, uh, maybe he's more comfortable being back in the NL Central, uh, or the AL Central, rather. Uh, I'm not sure. But he got Houston in his, um, in his first start, really suppressed pretty well. Got Houston for 8Ks in five innings. Pittsburgh... Um, no strikeouts there, so quite some variance still with, with Clevenger. Just 1K in five and a third, gave up four runs. Um, but was good in his last start against Baltimore. Five Ks in six innings, didn't give up a run. So serviceable he's been this year. Overall, we need to see the, the K stuff come back. Um, and targeting Philly is not something that I really want to be messing with. So uh, he's still giving up power to the left side. 217 average allowed, so not so much there. 310 Woba, not so much there. 181 ISO. A little susceptible there, but with some hard contact, 32.5%, and some fly balls, 066 ground ball to fly ball, translating to 1.7 homers per nine. On a barrel a little bit is Sunshine, so I'm not sure we want to be going after Philly with a couple of guys that can really make him work. Bryson Stott, they've been leading off. Um, eventually, they're going to get Harper back, probably not for a while, but... Uh, they've had Brandon Marsh, who they're sticking in the five hole uh, against righties. He's a perfectly serviceable bat um, as well. Of course, they have their big right-handed hitters, Trey Turner um, and JTR. Nick Castellanos has not been terrible. And have, certainly they have uh, Kyle Schwarber uh, from the left side. Schwarber is 6000 today, though. It's a little aggressive. Um, so the prices on the Phillies don't really make me want to go after them. You still got to pay 61 for Trey, um, 44 for Alec Bohm. Not super excited about that. Bryson Stott is playable at 38 at the top of the lineup, but not overly crazy about that. JTR still 55. So um, not wild about the price tags over here on Philly, but you can stack cl against Clevenger because he's still pitching to a, a good bit of contact. He's not going to throw it by people all that, all that regularly anymore. Um, even though he has been good. I think at 7900 is probably overpriced. I'd like to see him a little bit cheaper here. Um, though nobody's going to play him, and he has exhibited some decent stuff so far. He's survived against some, some good teams, uh, notably Houston, in his in his first outing. but um, And Baltimore, I, I suppose, in his last outing as well. Pittsburgh, not the most attackable lineup anymore either. So uh, he's been okay. Um, at 7,900, I'm not crazy about the price. It has, I mean, he's just kind of in the same range. He was 75, 77, 8, and 8,300 in his previous three starts. So not crazy about going after him here. And I really don't like attacking the Phillies, but I don't want to play him because they're really overpriced. So, um, overall, just kind of a, a stay away game for me. Not interested really in, in either side. Okay. Mets and Dodgers. Here's the Max Scherzer colored elephant on the mound. Um, 10-8 for Scherz, and, well, he's really the, he's he's the only guy that's got, like, really, really good K stuff, maybe a Justin Steele, who we'll get to, um, on the mound here today, and, unfortunately, he gets a Dodgers, right, and so, Scherz still has a home run problem, and maybe, maybe he's dealing with, like, a, a inflamed back, I think it is, um, something like that, but he should be good to go, and, um, it's been this, I guess it's this side that has been kind of ailing him for the past two seasons nearly. Um, he should be fine. And this is Scherzer. He's still got a 30% K rate, but it's Scherzer and he still has a power problem and a homer problem to left-handed hitters. He will give up some dingers because he's a heavy fly ball pitcher with the four seamer slider mix that we talk about. Um, changeup's really not all that good. Cutter that he's mixing in now, not all that good. Curveball's fine. Um, but a, a heavy fly ball lean here, and generally that's not 
a recipe we want to be messing with with the Dodgers because they have a lot of guys that can hit the baseball on a line here. Um, certainly Mookie, J.D. Martinez, uh, Freddie, of course, probably the best line drive hitter in baseball. Um, Max Muncy from the left side of the plate, James Outman, of course. So they've got some guys that can really make it difficult on Scherzer. They're still going to take pr pretty professional at-bats down here, despite the fact that in the early going, they're striking out at a 26% clip are the Dodgers against right-handers. 116 WRC+, plus, so, though, still, with a 224 ISO and a 350 WOBA. That's a 12% walk rate. Once again, the average walk rate so far is about 9%. So, um, what's that, 25, 33% larger? I think I said 25 earlier. In any case, this is the Dodgers. We don't really want to be going after guys, um, going after the Dodgers all that often. So, uh, he's going to be popular. And, and we're going to have to make some decisions with Scherzer because 10-8, you, you also have to pay for him. And it's really not the best matchup despite a 26 27% per, strikeout rate against righties this season. But you can go after him. You can play Scherzer. Um, but if Scherzer gets to like a 60% or, or 50% or something... Um, I don't know. We we might be able to come off of that a little bit. The problem is, I don't know who else you're going to play. It's certainly not Noah Syndergaard on the other side. 6,500 for Syndergaard, and we're not dealing with this against the Mets. It's just a total non-starter. Um, he was beat up pretty good in his last start, I believe. Uh, let's see. Let me pull up the... Actually, it was the start before that that he got beat up by Arizona. He was good against the Cubs. Went six innings, struck out nine. Um and really not sure where that came from, but he's had two of three good starts, one against Arizona, and then a bad one against Arizona in back-to-back -back starts. Uh, we saw that with Brad Keller here, so when that happens, it, we often side with the offense, right? Uh, but then he got the Cubs and, and went a full six innings and got him from nine. So um, two pretty good outings here, and overall at 6,500, if he's going to pop for 20 points, I think that's okay but it's pretty unlikely he's going to be able to pop for 20 points against the Mets in most scenarios. Very, very sticky lineup over here. 16% aggregate strikeout rate in 380 PAs against righties so far this season. Um, this is not including the, the games of uh, the 17th, but nevertheless, like that's a sh super short number, and I think it's the best in the league so far split adjusted. Um, just a 101 WRC plus for them and a 142 ISO with a 321 Woba, but a 15% walk rate. Like, um, this is a, a hard team to get around here, and I don't think with Syndergaard we're going to be messing with that. It's not that he's going to walk people or anything or that he's on the barrel, but he's mostly a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy with just a 17.5% K rate. So uh, the stuff isn't really all that good anymore, and he's not throwing 98 like he used to, um, so no thank you. I, I'd really prefer to side with the Mets here, and unfortunately, I think their prices are starting to pump, um, and we're really not all that excited about it. 5500 for Pete Alonso, it's still a fine price tag. You can pay for that. Frankie Lindor up to 52. Brandon Nimmo creeping up there as well, 45. Jeff McNeil, contact hitter in the middle of the lineup, good hitter, 3900 for him. Um, so we have some playable pieces here. You can play a Danny Vogelbach, 2,700 or something like that. Um, susceptibility is mostly to lefties anymore for Syndergaard. 277 average, 336 Woba, and a 174 ISO allowed, 13.5% K rate. So we can certainly go after him with lefties, and the Mets have a good couple of lefties that they can, they can get to him with. Um, certainly... A Frankie Lindor, he'll hit from both sides. He's probably my favorite here, price adjusted here in the uh, in the early going against Syndergaard. But you can you can stack everybody because he's not going to strike anybody out. So um, seems fine to get to the Mets. Also one of those frustrating teams to stack because they don't hit for a hell of a lot of power, more so than the Guardians uh, and the White Sox, but uh, not a whole hell of a lot. Okay, um, Wednesday at Coors, and the last game of this series, so we won't have to deal with Coors Field, at least for the um, for the next series. Uh, Yohan Oviedo on the mound, he's been really good in his last couple of starts. Austin Gomber going for the Rockies. Um, man, I, I kind of want to play Oviedo here. I'm not sure if I can do it. 
uh, <laughs> he's been so good in his last two starts against two pretty damn good teams. Um, yeah, maybe I can do it. I'll probably talk myself into having some here because this slider has been excellent this season. And he got through the White Sox and the Cardinals. He got the White Sox for five, but he went six and two thirds and didn't give up any any runs. But then he got the Cardinals for 10 Ks and seven full innings here. Um, Price isn't hasn't really come up all too terribly here. He was 68 in his first start against Boston, where he got kind of beat up. But 6,200 in it start against the Sox, and 6,000 flat in his last start against the um, against the Cardinals. So at 69, I think this is fine, even if he's pitching here at Coors Field. He's got a good four seamer and a good slider that he can stay down in the strike zone with. The curveball is a little worrisome. So this is the pitch that could get him into trouble. But a good ground ball to fly ball ratio from Oviedo so far. And I think this is attainable. Um, he's shown really good stuff so far this season. And the Rockies are bad, man. This team is very low upside. Um, even though they, they hit around Vince Velasquez a little bit, they still couldn't get to him. And he still struck out like five or whatever it was. So, um I think he's a very interesting tournament piece. Just because he's pitching a course field, he's not going to get played pretty much at all. So uh, I think you can go after Colorado here. Um, don't be surprised if he gets totally beat up but uh, and, and regresses really hard. So that said, you can still play some of the Rockies, but, man, they're frustrating to play here. Um, they're not going to be bad this season uh, for the entire season, as, as bad as they have been. Um, but they're they're bad and they're gonna strike out a lot. Certainly with guys against guys with stuff. Now in aggregate, just a 23% K rate, but this is gonna creep up uh, if he keeps exhibiting the same sort of strikeout stuff that he has um, coming into the year. So this is a pretty okay spot for Oviedo, and I mean I wouldn't blame you if you got some here. I'm not going going to get any Austin Gomber. He only has an 18% K rate and he hasn't shown any upside this season whatsoever. Um, so 5,700, this is a th attractive price tag, but, uh, no, thank you. Um, he's had three difficult matchups, admittedly, San Diego, Washington, and Seattle. Um, but there's no strikeout stuff for him. There's no suppression. He's given up three runs, five runs, and five runs. Uh, he's not going deep into starts. And unfortunately, uh, this is, this is noisy here. This pitches per start and innings per start it says seven, but he came out of the bullpen a lot last year because he couldn't stay in the rotation. So um, no thanks on, on Austin Gomber. We're going to want to get to Pittsburgh again. They're going to be very popular once again, uh, but they've been seeing the baseball for the entire series here, and I don't think that's really going to change. You could probably come off of a little bit of the ownership if they steam to like 20% or something. This is a full slate, and we've seen that you haven't really needed to stack Coors Field really in the last several series um, because they the Rockies have been so bad. The the opposing teams really haven't had to go off. Now, yeah, the Pirates put up 13 or whatever on, on Monday. Um, and that's going to happen on, on occasion. But uh, I think this is a fine spot to go back to some Pirates um, and, and getting – you know, it's a good healthy amount of them, but you'll probably end up coming in under the field because there's just so many other other games you can play. You know, but this is uh, once again, you're gonna have to make ownership decisions here. And if you want to get different with it, well, full stack the Pirates and then play uh, Yohan Oviedo uh, on the mound with him. I don't think many people are gonna be doing that at all. Okay, Cubs and the A's. Um, we don't have a, an announced starter yet for the A's, so not sure who it's gonna be. Um, and this is kind of the uh, the perils of, of doing a game or doing a breakdown the night before. So we'll just get to Steele. Um, 9,700 for Steele. This is a, like, I'm not sure where this came from. Like, I, I, I guess it's because he had an excellent start against the Dodgers. But, uh, like, we were paying nearly 2,000 less. Like, at the beginning of the season, he was 6,000. Now he's 9,700. Um, 6,000, 7,600, 7,900. He's been pretty good, for sure, but he's had some pretty decent matchups, Milwaukee, Texas, and the Dodgers, who are striking out. Um, now he gets the A's, so I think the price tag is actually kind of warranted. I'm not excited about paying for it, because I don't like buying 33% price bumps in 
in four weeks on a pitcher, but I we're kind of starving for some really attractive arms on the mound. Like Scherzer's in a bad spot. Steele here is in a pretty damn good spot, uh, to be quite honest. The A's here in the early going, 150 PAs against lefties, striking out at a 23% clip. 094 ISO with a 314 WOBA, and they're creating at a sneaky 106 WRC plus here. But, I, I mean, I don't know how. Hitting a lot of ground balls, and that's why we like playing Justin Steele. He's got a high K rate, 25%. High ground ball rate, 1.9 ground balls to fly ball. Elite against lefties in his last 29 and two-thirds. And elite against righties in his last 108 and a third. Um, no power, no average, no hard contact. Everything is everything is beautiful. And he stays off the barrel. Only susceptibility here is getting ahead of hitters at a sub-60% rate. It's not like a an alarming number here at 59.6%. Um but it does translate a little bit to some walk percentage. 9.5% in the walks, and that's a, a little concerning. If he does get a little wild, um, we did see, like, with Oakland, for example, against a, uh, uh, who was it, uh, Kodai Senga, who just didn't have it. Uh, it walked a few guys. They can, they can put some runs on you. And we are taking a little bit of risk, and certainly more risk at 9,700 than we were with with Steele at 6,000, uh, but this is still Oakland. They're still bad, and I th think we can still go after them with a 25% K rate arm, uh, despite a 99% walk rate. Um, so much on the ground here for Steele at 185 ground ball to fly ball in aggregate, uh, really to both sides of the plate, two O's ground balls to, to righties and 137 to lefties, very good numbers. Four seamer, we'd like to see him eke a little bit more value out of this, um, but the but the slider he stays way down in the strike zone with it. Uh, pretty damn good pitch here. So um, like Steele a lot, and it, I'm not crazy about the price tag, of course, but um, he's probably going to see a, a pretty hefty amount of ownership. I don't know if I had to guess it'd be 25 or 30 percent maybe, but um, I think it's playable and in tournaments you're going to need to get somewhere uh, if you want to come off of Scherzer. or you, I mean, you can probably play them both but i think this is a very playable spot um no idea who is going for the cubs as we said or going for the a's rather um so can't really talk about offense i don't want any of the a's whatsoever maybe we can get to the cubs because oakland's um oakland's pitching staff is pretty bad and you know they kind of disappointed uh on tuesday's slate but uh, they didn't on Monday slate, that's for sure. Um, so you could probably consider some some Cubs tournament stacks. All right, Atlanta and San Diego. Charlie Morton on the mound for the Braves. Oh, boy. Um, Charlie Morton is hard to figure out sometimes, um, at least for me. Like, we like playing Charlie, but he's got some variance with him, and that's because he's got really bad numbers against lefties, to be quite honest. Um, he was fine in his last start against the Royals, but still gave up two, kind of battled a little bit, and only struck out five uh, against the Royals, so that was pretty frustrating. And he's normally pretty damn good, but he just didn't have his best stuff. Um, now, going after the Padres, I really don't want to do this with a high-variance arm like Charlie um, and a high-variance pitch. Really with the curveball over here for him. Pretty good in in aggregate, uh, but the four-seamer is not good at all. And if he isn't feeling the curveball at all, uh, San Diego could make this really difficult on him. They are striking out, however, in the early going 25% K rate in their first 400 PAs this season. Um, we don't have Tatis back just yet. He will be there for the series uh, starting I believe Friday maybe on Thursday um, that's when he'll get activated but uh, we don't have him for this final game of the series here and we did see that Strider just tore these guys apart so um, he was excellent Charlie Morton is not Spencer Strider however but at 8800 I think a little bit of that non Spencer Strider-ness is kind of priced in um, so at eight, I think it's okay and he does still have K stuff 
uh, against the right side of the plate. This season, however, he's had two pretty bad matchups, and it will be the second time he has seen San Diego. He did get them in his second start of the year, sprayed six hits, gave up two runs, two earned runs, that is, and, uh, gave up three, and struck out six over five innings. Um, he's at same price tag, 8,800. He was 9K in that start, so it's down a little bit, um, and I think that is a little bit more attractive, but he's having some trouble throwing some strike one here at 58%. Um, 27% aggregate K rate is still strong for Charlie. And if the Padres are going to strike out at this 25% clip, you can definitely target him. Um, but I would probably be careful with my exposures, maybe getting, I don't know, 15% of Charlie. I think that's probably fine. I don't like getting too crazy with it because Charlie can put up a real crooked number in the, on the bad side for you real quick if he's not feeling this curveball um, because the rest of the arsenal is bad. Slider's bad, change is bad, four-seamer is awful. So uh, really susceptible to the left side of the plate, and that's uh, Juan Soto and Jake Cronenworth territory. Um, you can get to Crone. I believe he's 4,100, uh, or at least he was on Tuesday's slate. He is 3,700 now. Uh, that's a damn good price tag. He's actually got his second base eligibility back, so you can play him at first or second. Uh, I think that's a pretty good play, pretty good price-adjusted play. You can get to Soto, who's 5,200 now. Now we're starting to get into a price enforcement range for Soto, even though he's been pretty bad. Uh, is walking a little bit still, um, so that's encouraging for Soto, but uh, we're not touching any of this. Trent Grisham nonsense. He's still he might lead off and he might actually get Charlie here uh, at 3400. It's a fine leadoff piece because he's cheap and the plus side of the platoon is bad for Charlie. But uh, Grisham is a not a very good hitter. Um, strikes out a lot too. So we'll see. You're not going to mess mess around with the brunette Odor type of stuff. And some of these righties, even a Manny or a, a Bogarts or, or something, uh, they're not going to strike out a lot. But at their price tags, um, Bogarts at 5K flat, Manny at 49, they're a little bit better. Uh, so you could you could get off the board here. If, if Charlie's ownership comes in pretty high, um, then you can get off the board and stack some Padres. They'll definitely be off – um, off the reservation, so to speak, for a most of the field here, I, I would assume, uh, is going to be on Charlie. So I think that's where I'd side with Charlie uh, at the outset, but um, I do like a kind of a sneaky Padre stack here. There's some variance with Morton, definitely. Nick Martinez on the mound for the pods. No, thank you. Um, not against Atlanta. 20% K rate here. He has not been great, and I he's got a workable arsenal here. But the fastball is just so bad, the four-seamer. I wish he'd just totally ditch it and, and go exclusively sinker-cutter um, change-up curveball mix and and really mix in the slider as well since it's a similar pitch to the cutter. The other pitches are pretty damn good, but the four-seamer is so bad at extreme negative value for him. He can't throw it for a strike. And he's really on the barrel with it a lot of the time, giving up a lot of power to the left side, 182 ISO. Does have some swing and miss here. That's with the changeup against lefties. But the 182 ISO and a 1.8 homers per nine uh, to the left side of the plate, that's very worrisome. And that's Matt Olson. That's Ozzie Albies. Um, that's uh, Sammy Hilliard, for example. Um, that's uh, Eddie Rosario. So they've got some lefties here that can make it difficult on Nick Martinez. I prefer the Braves um, pretty exclusively here, even though it's an attractive price tag, 7300 I just don't think he's got enough raw K stuff to blast through Atlanta with all that much regularity because they are striking out at a 25% clip. You just need guys that can throw it past them. Uh, to realize this number. 200 ISO nearly with a 340 Woba, 10% walk rate themselves. Um very dangerous offense over here. Acuna will hit righties. Austin Riley will hit righties. Uh, Sean Murphy got into a ball against Blake Snell. 4,800 for him. Not crazy about that. But, um, you know, so you'd have to pay for the Braves here against Nick Martinez. So that will keep their ownership down definitely. Um, and so it's not my favorite stack, you know, price adjusted. But uh, if you want to go after some offense in this game, I think that's perfectly warranted. Um, 
if I had to rank them, I would say probably oy, 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 uh, probably the Braves, then Charlie Morton, then the Padres, then Nick Martinez or something like that um, in, in order of, like, favorites. Um, but not terribly crazy about going after a lot of ownership here in this game. Uh, high upside for the high upside spot for the Braves, sure. If you want to get them at low ownership. Okay, last game of the day: Milwaukee and Seattle. Um, Eric Lauer on the mound. I think we can target him. And I'm not playing. I'm not. I'm not playing him against the Mariners. I think we can play the Mariners against him. Um, looks like we're gonna have Marco go. Um, coming back, I think he was hurt. I can't remember off the top of my head. Missed a start, maybe. Uh, I forget exactly what. Oh no! It was uh, it was the daddy list. He he was on the paternity list. Had his kid, and um, so he'll be back and should be fine. Eighty one hundred. I'm not crazy about that. I very rarely get the opportunity to play Marco, uh, and it's never at an elevated price tag. Uh, Eighty one hundred is is certainly elevated for him. I love watching him pitch, um, but. I, unfortunately, he just doesn't have the, the raw upside for to, to play him in, in DFS uh, all that often. 13% K rate is one of the lowest numbers in baseball for a starting pitcher. Now, he'll give up some contact, and Brewers, their weakness has really always been striking out. Uh, we have him here in the early going, 116 PAs. Short sample, of course. 73 WRC plus with a 31% K rate against lefties. That's a big number. Uh, but Marco still just doesn't have enough in the tank to throw it by them. Pitches to a lot of contact, 84%, but it's good contact. Not on the barrel, it's not hard. And he induces a lot of soft contact with a pretty damn good change. Um, it's kind of surprising that it's negative value relative to league average. But as I've always thought, this was a really excellent pitch. And it's really his main pitch. So um, doesn't throw very hard, throws sub 90 miles an hour, but mixes up speeds, mixes up counts. This guy's a pitcher over here, and um, he's enjoyable to watch when he's really going. He could be tough to watch when he's uh, when he's not really going. So um, you can stack the Brewers here because he pitches to so much contact, but uh, be prepared to get frustrated um, sometimes because Marco can really do that to you. He's a, he's a good arm. Um, but can't play him, unfortunately, at 8,100. So let's get to Eric Lauer, 92 for him. He's got a little bit of, of K stuff, uh, and he was fine in his last start, I believe, against uh, maybe the Padres. I could be making this up. Uh, it was it was San Diego, uh, and he was fine. Went six innings, struck out five, and only gave up one run, just sprayed five hits around. So um, that's a serviceable outing, definitely against the Padres. Uh, he got beat up pretty good by the Cardinals in his previous start. That's when we uh, – we, have really been attacking. I've been attacking him all season. Um, hasn't worked. Well, it worked once. Uh, hasn't hasn't worked the other time. The other two times. He, he got the Cubs for five and a third and six Ks. Only gave up two runs there. So um, still gives up power to righties. Not so much in the way of average, but a 204 ISO. Does have a, some Ks against righties. Um, but a 1.7 homers per nine. And I'm going to attack that number. Uh, pretty much ad infinitum um, against Eric Lauer. He just gives up too many balls in the air uh, against righties. An 064 ground ball to fly ball. Uh, we don't really want to go after him with lefties. If you want to stack Seattle, yeah, throw in Jared Kelnick uh, it, if you want. Um, he may get a day off, who knows, But uh, with, a, with a day game against the lefty. But they got a lot of righties over here to Seattle, uh, and so I'm not, I'm not messing with this. Give me Julio. 59's not great. Um, it's fine though. It's Julio. Uh, he's been a little cold to start the season, but, um, still very attainable and, and one of the highest upside plays of the day for sure. Ty France, 49, pretty good hitter, pretty overpriced. I would say Tay Oscar down to 4,800 from 54 the night before. Um, so that's a bit more attractive. I like that price a, a good bit. Gino Suarez at 4,000 flat. That's fine as well. Cal Raleigh, he might not be in the list. You'd probably see something like a Tom Murphy, uh, maybe even a Cooper Hummel behind the plate. Who knows? Uh, AJ Pollock was not in the in the lineup on Tuesday, so he'll probably be in there uh, on Wednesday at 3,300. So I think that's a playable price also. 
Uh, so give me some Seattle here. I'm not sure what their ownership is going to come in like. Um, it'll probably be depressed though because you got that Coors Field game. So uh, this is Seattle's definitely one of the stacks that I I like. Um, now in the early going, they are striking out at kind of an alarming clip. I mean, it's 125 PAs against lefties, 27 and a half percent K rate. Um, he'll st- still hitting for a little bit of power, but a 286 Woba, not walking a whole lot, hell of a lot. Uh, 8% is fine, but uh, an 088 ground ball to fly ball. So they're going to get the baseball in the air here, and that's a bad recipe for Eric Lauer because he's going to give it up in the air. And a lot of hard contact on the barrel to the right side, 38% nearly. Um, give me some Seattle and and give me all of them. I'm not, I'm not going to be playing Eric Lauer here today, and I hope it doesn't burn me once again. So you can get to this to the Brewers here against Marco because he pitches to infinite contact uh, and definitely get to some Seattle. No pitching in this game for me. Uh, so that's it for the breakdown. No idea how long this went. I think it went pretty long. But um, that said, um, yeah, we'll uh, quickly go through stacks, I suppose. Uh, maybe a little bit of San Francisco attacking the righty split for Trevor Rogers. Uh, probably no Miami. Like some Alex Cobb, definitely. Um, maybe some short Cleveland and maybe some short Detroit, but, uh, no pitching in, in the, um, in the Cleveland Detroit game for me, Arizona and St. Louis also no pitching here offense only like a lot of offense. This will be, uh, your most popular game outside of Coors. Almost definitely Texas, Kansas city. Um, I mostly pitching here for me. I think give me some Brady singer, against Texas uh, to, to bounce pretty hard uh, and give me a good bit of Martin Perez as well. I like that spot. Uh, Philly and the White Sox, not crazy about pretty much anything here, to be honest. I'm not wild about the pricing or the upside for the White Sox uh, and also not wild about the pricing or the upside for either Taiwan Walker or Mike Clevenger. So there you have it. Um, Mets and Dodgers, you could stack the Mets uh, against Syndergaard, I think. You could also stack the Dodgers against Scherzer. It's not out of um, out of the realm of possibility that uh, Scherzer gets blown up. Like we saw the Brewers get him for like four dingers or or something uh, earlier in the season. So Pittsburgh and Colorado. Once again, you're gonna have to get it right. Maybe give me a little bit of Yohan Oviedo. Really good slider for him this season so far. Um, not super crazy about the price tag, but it's still playable at 6,900. No Gomber. Um, probably some Rockies. Yeah. Maybe some Charlie Blackman. He's still at a cheap price. Uh, some Ryan McMahon. They, they got into some balls. Um, so maybe starting to see the the baseball a little bit better. You can play some of the Rockies, definitely. Um, so if they get completely ignored because they've been so horrific, go ahead and get on to them and, and attack some regression that is likely coming for Juan Oviedo. Uh, we need to see more out of him you know, before we're like super convinced that he's just excellent. Uh, give me Justin Steele. And probably some of the Cubs. I don't know. They get Oakland. Uh, who knows who they're who they're gonna throw? Uh, Atlanta and San Diego. Some Charlie a little bit. Mostly the Braves. No Nick Martinez. Maybe some um, some Padres. Milwaukee and Seattle. Just give me the Mariners and all of them. Um, and no pitching on in this game for me. You can stack the Brewers too. So that's it, guys. Uh, keep an eye out for the projections. We will have them. Uh, once again, it's an early start, so um, keep an eye out, and good luck if you're punting the day slate.